All right, well, good morning again. I guess, I, I guess that Tuesday is a big day. And uh, people are, are nervous about what's going to happen. They're not sure what the outcome is going to be. Uh, some people are highly stressed. I, I know that it's likely that there will be millions of people, not just here but around the world, glued to the television uh, to see the results. And there's really two distinct sides, and there's not a lot of middle ground. And there's even a little bit of hatred, it seems, between the two sides. And people are anxious because they think this, this is really feels like it's a matter of life and death. And we just don't know what's going to happen. And you all know what I'm talking about, right? It's, it's the Champions League soccer game between <laughs> Liverpool and Red Star Belgrade. How many, how many of you are, are going to be watching that on Tuesday? Yeah, all right, I am. Go Liverpool, right? I know some of you thought I was talking about something else, didn't you? And you were kind of getting nervous because, you know, it's one of those unwritten rules that in church you don't talk about politics, right? But, you know, the gathering's never really been about following the rules. So I thought, hey, why not have some fun? And we'll stick with Ephesians this week, but we're going to have Ephesians, the election edition. Now, some of you really are nervous. <laughs> like, oh, no, what's he, what's he going to do? What's he going to say? You know, here's the truth. We started this Ephesians series uh, in the summertime. And, and whenever we've gone through a book of the Bible, I always sketch out this schedule ahead of time, and I'm always wrong. And, and so I actually thought we were going to be done with Ephesians by the end of August. And I had a whole different sermon series that we were going to do this fall. Obviously, I was wrong about that because it's November and we're still not finished. Uh, but we're close. Uh, what happens is I get into these passages and the more I study them, I'm like, I can't say everything that's here in, in 30 minutes. And so I have to break it up into two sermons or three sermons and, and it just keeps growing and growing. So I had no idea last summer when we started Ephesians that on this Sunday, Right before this election that really seems like a big deal, we were going to be at Ephesians 6.12, which is maybe the most relevant verse in the Bible for people who are facing an election in 2018. I had no idea that was going to happen, but it did. And so I said, hey, let's embrace it and let's see what this has to say to us. So if you've got your Bibles, open them to Ephesians chapter 6, and we're going to just look at verse 12 today and see how Paul's wisdom for a church in Ephesus 2,000 years ago is powerfully relevant for a church in Centerville today. All right, here's what Paul writes, Ephesians 6, 12. He says, for our struggle. Now, let's stop there just for a second. All right, if you're a follower of Jesus, if you're a child of God, you are going to struggle. All right? There's no promises anywhere in the Bible. God has never said, hey, if you follow me, life is going to be easy. In fact, it's the exact opposite. There's almost this promise that life is going to be difficult. There's going to be struggle. There's going to be hard times. And the reason is because it's in the struggle, it's in the wrestling, it's in the difficult times that God shapes us into the people he wants us to be. And so if you are a Christian, if you're following Christ, you are going to struggle. And Paul says, our struggle is not against flesh and blood. This is a really powerful statement. He says, our fight is not against people. Our wrestling is not against those around us. Now, now this, is, this is a truth that it goes through the whole Bible. But especially in the New Testament, and especially beginning with the teachings of Jesus, is this idea that God's children do not fight against people. Our struggle is not against flesh and blood. And this truth is powerful for today and for this coming week when we're headed into this really, really intense election season in our country and what feels like this time that's been very divisive and we've been ripped apart. And we kind of have this temptation to have the wrong idea about who our enemies are and who our fight is against. 
If you watch TV, and actually I recommend that you don't for the next couple days, but if you watch TV, uh, the people on there are going to tell you who your enemy is. And it depends on which station you watch, who they'll say is your enemy, but they're going to tell you who you're fighting against. And they're going to tell you who your struggle is against. But Paul is saying to us, they're all wrong. Because our enemy is not flesh and blood. Our struggle is not against other people. And let's be really practical here, all right? Barack Obama is not your enemy. And Donald Trump is not your enemy. And Paul Ryan is not your enemy. And Nancy Pelosi is not your enemy. And Chuck Schumer is not your en enemy. And Mitch McConnell is not your enemy. We could keep going, right? We could go all the way through all of them. The Republicans are not your enemy. And the Democrats are not your enemy. And CNN is not your enemy. And your fight is not with Fox News. And the people who cast a vote differently than you are not your enemy. And the people who campaign for ideas with which you disagree are not the ones that you're supposed to fight against. Your enemy is not flesh and blood. And that's all I have to say to you today. Now go out and live like Jesus. No, I'm just kidding. Paul says your enemy is not flesh and blood. God's people do not fight against other people. Now, listen, this is, he's not saying that there are not people who do evil things, because there are. There are people who make bad choices, who do wickedness. And, and he's not saying that there are not people who are going to mistreat you, because there are. You will be mistreated. It will happen. And he's not even saying that there are not people who set themselves up against the rule of God, because there are. There are people who live against God. But what he is saying is that that is not your fight. Let him handle that. God's people do not fight against other people. Let's keep going. He says, your struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. So, so Paul's setting up this, this image of two kingdoms. There's the kingdom of light, the kingdom of God, the kingdom of Jesus. And then there's this dominion of darkness that is opposed to God and, and everything that God is about. And, and that dominion of darkness began to influence creation in Genesis 3, when the serpent came and deceived Adam and Eve, and it continues to this very day. And so even though we live in the world created by God, and the world in which God has complete control and authority over, we also live in a world that has fallen prey to the mid dominion of darkness. And Paul says that's who your struggle is against the dark forces of this world. Now, now, sometimes when we start talking about Satan and his angels, uh, we, we get the wrong idea. See, I don't, I don't think that Satan is this little red guy who stands on your shoulder and has horns and a tail and a pitchfork and he just keeps poking you. That's, that's not who Satan is. In fact, probably Satan was God's most beautiful creation. He was an angel of light. See, here's the first thing I want you to understand about Satan and his angels is that they are created beings. They were made by God. They were angels created by him, designed to give him glory and to live for him and to do his will, but their pride caused them to fall and they became the powers of darkness. They are not equal to God. Right? Sometimes we think, well, you've got God and you've got Satan and they're kind of battling against each other and who knows who's going to win. That's not true. God is the creator, and Satan is created. And here's what that means for us. We don't get to say, the devil made me do it. He's just, he's just another created being. And, and he can influence us, and he can impact us, but at the end of the day, he cannot have victory over us. Because God has said that is so. And, and so, when I find myself in trouble, and when I make mistakes, and when I do things wrong, I don't get to say the devil made me do it because I made the choice. 
Satan and his angels are created beings. However, Satan and his angels desire power over God's creation. His, his goal since the beginning has been to destroy the goodness of God's creation. That's why he deceived Adam and Eve. That's why he influenced Cain to kill his brother Abel. That's why throughout history, he has done everything he can to wreak as much havoc as he can and bring chaos into God's creation. And that is his goal today as much as it was thousands and thousands of years ago. Peter warns us about this. In 1 Peter chapter 5, he, he writes, Be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Satan wants to destroy you. And that's why your fight is against him. He wants to destroy you. How does he do that? Well, Satan and his angels gain power through temptation. That's his tool. That was his tool with Adam and Eve. That was his tool later on with King David. That was his tool with Peter. That's his tool with us. He uses temptation to gain power. James wrote about this in James chapter 1. He said, when tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. But each person is tempted when they are dragged away by their own evil desire and enticed. So James here is, gives us a little bit of an anatomy of temptation. And I want you to see how this works. Because this is your fight. God's children do not fight other people. God's children fight temptation. And if you're going to go out and be a warrior, and I want you to be. And by the way, next week, this is really cool how this worked out. Next week, Veterans Day weekend, we're on the armor of God. So that's kind of a cool thing. Anyways, we'll talk more about fighting next week. But if you're going to go out and be a warrior for God and you're going to fight, you're not fighting against people, you're fighting against temptation. So today is the day when we figure out how that works. And here's what James says. It starts with desire. So he says, each person is tempted when they are dragged away by their own evil desire. And here's the thing you need to understand about desire. Desire is always shiny and it always distracts us from the good that God has done. Desire is always shiny. What do I mean by that? I mean it looks good. Satan does not bring ugly desires into our lives because we don't want what's ugly. Yesterday at lunch, Marianne ordered this pea soup. And, and I know that some of you guys like pea soup. You maybe even think it's delicious. I have no idea because I have never eaten or tasted pea soup because it looks disgusting. It looks like an alien vomited. And because it looks disgusting, I do not desire it. We don't desire ugly stuff. We desire what's shiny and what looks good to us. And it's our evil desires that distract us from the good that God has provided. So be aware. When you find yourself desiring something that's not what God has provided for you, that's not what God has given to you, this is one of those evil desires that James is talking about. And what happens is that we begin with desire and then we feed it with focus. We keep focusing on that thing that we desire. We keep thinking about it, how much we need it, how much we want it, why it's good for us. Sometimes we even start to write stories in our mind about it. We justify our desire. We explain away any thoughts that we might have that it's wrong. And we focus, and we focus, and we focus, and that desire grows within us and grows within us, and at just the wrong time, the trap is sprung. And we give in to the temptation. And we find ourselves doing things we never thought we would do, going places we never thought we would go, becoming people we never thought we could be because we allowed that desire to grow up inside of us. This is what happened with Adam and Eve in the garden. They had this desire for power. 
They, they wanted to be like God, to know what God knew, to be able to have his understanding. And instead of rejecting that desire and saying that's not something God has provided, it's not something we need, they thought about it, they contemplated it, and they discussed it with the serpent. And, and eventually, that desire for power grew up inside of them and caused them to compromise and disobey. And they fell to temptation. Cain, their son, had this desire for acceptance. He wanted God to accept his sacrifice, even though he didn't offer the sacrifice God told him to offer. And his desire for acceptance caused him to get angry and to rage against and mistreat and kill his brother. King David. King David desired pleasure. Remember he was out on his roof looking out over the city and he sees this beautiful woman and says, I want her. That will make me feel good. And he kept thinking about it and he kept looking and he kept feeding that desire and ultimately that desire for pleasure caused him to violate the vows he had made before God. And eventually led to adultery and even murder. The Apostle Peter, one of Jesus' closest friends, is standing by the fire warming himself while Jesus is on trial for his life. And he has a desire for security. Because people come up to him and say, hey, weren't you with Jesus? Aren't you one of his followers? Aren't you a Galilean? And Peter has this desire to be safe, to be secure, and so he kind of massages the truth and he cuts a corner and he tells a little white lie, I don't know that guy. And he denies his Savior. You see, when we feed the wrong desires, it takes us down the wrong path and leads us where we never thought we would go. When Adam and Eve fell into temptation, it destroyed their relationship with their creator, it destroyed their relationship with each other, and it destroyed their relationship with the garden. When Cain fell into temptation, it destroyed his relationship with his brother, and it destroyed his relationship with his parents. When David fell into temptation, It destroyed his relationship with God. It destroyed his relationship with his army. It destroyed his relationship with his sons who went on to kill each other over and over again because the sins of the father were passed on to the sons. When Peter gave in to temptation, it destroyed his relationship with Jesus. But here's the cool thing. Jesus forgave him. And after Jesus came back from the dead, he pulled Peter aside and he said, Peter, do you love me? And Peter said, yes. And Jesus said, then feed my lambs. And then he said again, Peter, do you love me? And Peter said, Jesus, you just asked me that. Yes. And Jesus said, then feed my lambs. And then a third time, Jesus said, Peter, do you even like me? And Peter said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. And Jesus said, feed my lambs, because what Jesus was doing was he was forgiving Peter. And so that Peter, who fell three times into the temptation to deny Jesus, was given three times to tell Jesus he loved him. And I want you to hear this today because if you have fallen into temptation, and you have, Jesus forgives you. This place here is not a place where we come and yell at each other because we've messed up. It's a place where we love each other because God has rescued us. And every single one of us has fallen into temptation, probably this week. And I want you to hear this. God rescues every single one of us. Listen to what Paul wrote in Colossians chapter 1. It sounds a lot like what he wrote in Ephesians 6. He said, For he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the Son he loves, in whom we have redemption and the forgiveness of sin. You see, redemption means that Jesus has made right what we made wrong. Our sin, our shortcomings, our mistakes, our fall into temptation has been made right by Jesus. He has redeemed us. And because Jesus has redeemed us, God has 
forgiven us. And when God forgives, it's as far as the east is from the west. It's like he takes our sins and removes them as far as you can possibly imagine. And he no longer sees your sins. He no longer sees your shortcomings. He only sees the righteousness of Jesus in you. And and so this morning, if you're listening to me and, and you're hearing me talk about temptation and it's making you uncomfortable because you know you've messed up, and you're hearing me talk about Adam and Eve or Cain or David or Peter, and you're associating yourself with one of those and saying, yes, that's me, that's my story. Please hear this. Give it to Jesus, and he gives you his new life. And today is a brand new day, full of hope and full of joy and full of peace and full of forgiveness. God has forgiven you. He's rescued you. And here's the thing about being rescued. When you get rescued, you don't dive right back into what had you in trouble. My family loves Shark Week. Uh, I think they like the episodes best when there's an actual shark attack. So it's like we watch it, and it's like, this is kind of boring. Nobody's getting eaten, which I think reflects very poorly on my children and whoever raised them. But one of the things you never see on Shark Week, you see somebody get attacked by a shark and they drag them up into the boat, right? And they're in the boat and they're laying there and they're missing an arm or they're missing a leg and there's blood everywhere and it's spurting and nobody says, hey, throw me back in the water. I want to see the shark again. Because when you've been rescued, you don't dive right back into what was destroying you. And if you've been rescued from temptation, Why would you dive right back into it? And so what I want to give you this morning is an understanding of how you can not only be forgiven from temptation, but how you can defeat it and destroy it. Because your fight is not against other people, your fight is against temptation. So so look at 1 Corinthians chapter 10. This is Paul writing again, and it still sounds, he's still using the same language, right? And he says this, for though we live in the world, We do not wage war as the world does. You see, the people around you wage war differently, especially this week, right? They wage war with words and with with hatred and sometimes with violence. And Paul says, that's not how we are. We're different. He says, we don't wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. Now, Now, listen closely to this. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And we take captive every thought. If you're a Bible underliner or circler or writer in your Bible, get that part right there. We take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. You see, our battle, our battle is not against other people. Our battle is not against our political enemies. Our battle is not against the people who disagree with us. Our battle is not even against the people who want to do harm to us. What did Jesus say about that? Love your enemies. Pray for and bless those who mistreat you. Our battle is against ourselves. You see, if we want to defeat the power of darkness, we do that by defeating the darkness in our minds. It's what Paul means when he says we take captive every thought, every dark desire. We take it captive and we subject it to the rule of Jesus. And so I maybe, I I look around me and I I see this guy who lives next to me and he's got this amazing boat and I kind of wish I had a boat like that. Or I look on the other side of me and they've got a bigger house than me and I wish I had a, a big house like that. Or down the street is a guy who's got a better job than me and he makes more money than me and I wish I could make as much money as him. And I've got this desire, right? Because if I have a little bit more, then I'll be secure or I'll be happy or I'll be content with just a little bit more and I dwell on that desire for more and I feed it and I focus on it. And finally I say, you know, if I cut a corner here, or if I just take a little bit more here, or if I just tell a little bit white of a white lie here, then I can have what I desire. 
and the shininess of the desire has distracted me from what God has provided. Paul says, no. Take that thought captive. When I find myself desiring what someone else has, I take that thought captive and I acknowledge it. I say, that desire is not from God. And I get rid of it and I replace it. I say, my God has supplied all my needs according to his riches in glory. Or maybe that, that desire that's growing inside of me is a, a desire for vengeance or for, for anger or for hatred because someone said something about me or done something to me or maybe I just don't like them. And I think about how much I dislike this person and I think about how much this person has wronged me and I think about all the opportunities that I might have to, to get revenge, to feel better about it myself, and I let that desire grow and grow and grow, and eventually I lash out. And with my words, or with my actions, I destroy someone who's been made in the image of Christ. Paul says, no. No, when that thought begins, when it's in its infant stages, take it captive. And remind yourself that that peace I give to you, peace not of this world, love your neighbor, love your enemy. Consider others better than yourself. You you see, if I fill my mind with Scripture, if I fill my mind with the truth of God, that when these desires come in, I can take them captive, I can throw them out, and I can replace them with what God has already given me. You know, I, I know that this week, this is going to be tough, right? Because we all have opinions. And this week is, of all times, people are going to tell us, you have enemies, you need to fight, you need to get out there and get angry, get mad, take action. That is not your fight. Take those thoughts captive and throw them out and replace them with the love and the peace and the hope and the joy of Jesus. We do not struggle against flesh and blood. That's not our fight. That fight's been won at the cross. Let's take every thought captive this week and turn our hearts and our minds towards God and all the good that he has provided. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for all of the good you've brought into our lives. And we repent of the times when we're distracted from that by the desires of this world. And we are so grateful for your forgiveness and for the new life that you offer us. And my prayer this morning, God, is that uh, for those who are here right now, who for that first time are, are considering giving their life to you and leaving the old life behind, I pray that you would encourage them, that you would pour your peace into them, so that they would know that becoming your child is the most important thing they can do in their life. And Father, this week, help us to be the light in the world instead of the darkness. Help us to be peacemakers. Help us to listen. Help us to love. Help us to be the light of the world. Help us to point everyone around us to you. In your name, amen.